Since 1887, the Stonington Free Library has been a center for knowledge, ideas, creativity, and entertainment. It is a comfortable and welcoming community space for the town of Stonington, Connecticut, where all ages can explore, discover, gather and learn within a building of distinctive and unique architecture. This video program is an evolution to expand the offerings of the library to share directly in your home or organization. Welcome to the Sunday Evening Lecture Series made available to you by the Stonington Free Library. That's the first time anyone called me a Renaissance man and a writer. 
You're not a writer until you publish a book. This guy has published 16 books. That's why he can be so cavalier about the compliment. Anyway, this is a very complex, deep author, the greatest author in the world. And it's appropriate that we try to deal with him with humor and with a light heart. So, Michaela, would you please give us our introductory piece. Only Cole Porter has the wit to be able to do something about Willie the Shake. And here it is from Kiss Me Kate. Cole Porter. Now, how do you deal with the deepest, most important, most vivid, most complex author in the world? Somebody who wrote 37 plays, 154 sonnets, several long poems. Someone who is so unknown that people aren't sure he wrote these works. They ascribe them to Kit Marlowe and a number of people. People who are amazed that a boy from a small town in England who never went to university could write plays and histories about every part of the world. We're going to look at one of the histories this evening, Henry V. He wrote two others, of, uh, or three others, about the English uh, people. First was Richard II, the second was Henry IV, and the next Henry IV, part two. So when we approach an enormously complex subject with a man who has given so much to the world, some people feel that he invented 1,700 words, but there are armies of Shakespeare scholars who make their living on them, and a group of them got together and determined Lo and behold, it wasn't 1,700 words he discovered. It was 422. <laughs> In addition to discovering words that we're using today, his, his sentences, his words, are the subject of every book you read, every movie you see, every title you hear, often is related to him. As Harold Bloom, the great critic from Yale, said, he is so well known that he's pervaded our culture. The only person, the only man, better known than Hamlet is Jesus Christ. And when he does characters, he goes so deeply into them, like Hamlet and Falstaff, he not only teaches us about these people, he teaches us about life. Now, my feeling about reading the great authors is you only do it to learn more about life. And in approaching Shakespeare, I have taken a simple route. So we have a vast, complex set of works. The, the, each play is long and complicated with many characters. 
So here's what we do. We just look at his words. That's what we're going to do this evening. We're going to look at four plays. The first one is Henry V. The second one is Hamlet. The next one is Lear. The next one is Antony and Cleopatra. And then we're going to look at two sonnets. And from those works, we're going to take lines and words which we can understand together make him better than anybody else. So let's start. Ladies, isn't he terrific? That Jude Law is Henry V. Now, Henry V is one of the few Shakespearean characters who's pure. He isn't going to kill his brother. He isn't trying to steal lands away from neighboring people, except the French. He doesn't have an enormous ego. He isn't overly sensitive. He believes that his power comes from God. He's a religious man. And he believes he's there to serve his people. Now, when we look at the words, and we're going to just look at the words he speaks to his troops before the Battle of Agincourt. We can't look at the whole play. When we look at his words, we have to understand what is the historical human context in which Shakespeare uses the words that we're studying. The context here is the Hundred Years' War between France and England, between 1350, uh, 50 and 1450. <clears throat> Henry V gets an army of 12,000 people. He crosses the channel and goes to northern France to take back some of the land that he believes belongs to England. Now, he has a couple of battles where he loses about half his men. So instead of 12,000, he has 6,000. The French king and the rest of France believe we finally got him. We're going to amass an enormous army the army is going to be cavalry with heavy armor. He's got about 6,000. We're going to put 30,000 men in an army. We're going to surround him and finally annihilate him, and the Hundred Years' War will be over. Aha! Now we get a chance to understand Shakespeare's language, because what does Henry V do? He travels early in the morning before the battle around his men without his kingly attire on, incognito. He discovers that his men are disgusted with being there. They've lost their comrades. Back at home, their brother is waking up with his wonderful young wife in the morning with a cup of coffee. And they're in France about to be annihilated by a huge army. They don't have a chance. So, this is the opportunity for Shakespeare to use language that Henry V speaks to his troops to turn a group of men who believe they should be back in England, who are lamenting the fact that they don't have more troops, into men capable of defeating that army. So let's just look at some of his language. This is all from Act 5. The royal captain, walking from watch to watch, calls them brothers, friends, and countrymen, plucks everyone who sees him, every wretch pining and pale before, plucks comfort from his looks. This is my favorite line in all of Shakespeare, you know why. Harry Martin is giving the talk. A little touch of Harry in the night. Imagine w walking around with your troops. Henry has heard that they believe they need more men from England. No, he turns it around, Shakespeare does. The fewer men, the greater share of honor. You're lucky there's no one else here. <clears throat> and then he says, and listen to the words Shakespeare uses, the way he uses them. By Jove, I am not covetous for gold, but if it be a sin to cover, covet honor, I am the most offending man alive. 
That is the kind of use of words that no one else can do. I am the most offending man alive. He who has no stomach for this fight, let him depart. We wouldn't die in his company. Get out of here, cowards. By this time, these poor soldiers of his actually are beginning to feel they're in the right place. They shouldn't be back in England. And then he tells them what's going to happen after they win. This is the Feast of Crispin, I think it was October 15. And so he says, this day is called the Feast of Crispin. This is, now he's describing what's going to happen. He that outlives this day and comes safe home will stand a tiptoe when this day is named. He that shall live this day and see old age will yearly on the vigil feast his neighbors and say, tomorrow is St. Crispin's. He'll strip his sleeve and show his scars and say, these wounds I had on Crispin's day. How wonderful, how lucky you are to be here. And this is the only place the ego comes in a little bit on the top. Then shall our, and these are his, his dukes and, and, and senior warriors. Then shall our names, <clears throat> Harry the King, Bedford and Exeter, Walworth, Talbert, Salisbury, Gloucester, be in their flowing cups, freshly remembered. Every time they drink to it, from now on, they'll remember how glorious it was. From this day until the ending of the world, now we come on a line that you've all heard. There's a great movie in the Second World War with this title. And he's looking at his people and he says in conclusion, we few, we happy few, we band of brothers. How many remember that and how many have seen that movie? Come on, hands up, all right. For he today who sheds his blood with me shall be my brother. Be he ne'er so vile, this day shall gentle his condition. Now, England was very stratified with social, and being a gentleman was an important thing. So anyone who's there and sheds his blood with him will be a gentleman. And gentlemen in England now abed, those guys you envy but you shouldn't, shall think themselves a curse they were not here. And listen to this. And hold their manhoods cheap whilst any speaks that fought with us St. Crispin's Day. So this is one of the half a dozen great speeches a combat commander, Alexander the Great, made speeches like this. The Duke of Wellington made one to his men at Waterloo before the battle. Um, Civil War people made them. And this is Henry V, our pure Shakespearean character. Aha! We go to a man who's totally different. A raging, neurotic, intellectual, who can't make his mind up who gives us the greatest play in the world because he agonizes about his indecision and his weakness. But he's a deep character. Hamlet, all right? Now, <clears throat> Hamlet's father has just died. We're putting the context for the words now. His father has died. Hamlet is very suspicious. He doesn't know how it happened. His uncle marries his mother within a month, which infuriates. Hamlet. Hamlet begins to act like a madman. He comes into a room, this is act one, scene one, and his mother Gertrude and his stepfather are talking about how difficult he is. And <clears throat> now look at this first line. This is the line where Hamlet, probably the greatest character in literature, is first introduced to the audience of the play. And someone told me this, ah, who told me but my grandchild and I've forgotten something, everyone. Oh, I've forgotten to say thank you to family members. Susan and I have six children. 
and there is a member from every one of those families sitting in the lit group of nine right there even though there's school tomorrow and work tomorrow and there are two precious grandchildren Allegra and Riley I should have said this in the beginning and I'm particularly worried because Riley is an accomplished actress and she's going to be critical of my performance <laughs> Am I going to be okay? All right. And the other two groups I didn't thank were the Sunday Lunch Bunch and the Men's Reading Group, and you know who you are, and thanks for coming. Okay, so now, Hamlet, Shakespeare uses an aside, which is something we don't do anymore. He turns to the audience, and he's describing his uncle. And the beauty of this is those first five or six words. He describes his uncle, a little more than kin and less than kind. What are the two words in that sentence that make it so evocative? Kin and kind. A my uncle is a little more than kin now. He's married my mother, but he's less than kind. And then he goes into his usual Folder all about the solid flesh would melt, etc., etc. He can't do anything, doesn't know what to do. All right. Then we go to the next statement of, of, of Hamlet. Only now something has changed, the context has changed, so the language is stronger. <clears throat> Hamlet has been up on the ramparts of the castle. His father has come back as a ghost and specifically told him that your uncle killed me by pouring poison in my ear and you have to avenge me. So now Hamlet, our character, is more worked up and more to the point <coughs> and then he uses these wonderful oh what a rogue and peasant slave am I that I, son of a dear father, murdered prompted to my vengeance by heaven and hell must like a whore unpack my heart with words. He doesn't have the courage to do anything about it. And then probably the most famous line of all Shakespeare. <clears throat> and how many of you, when you look at these lines, to be or not to be, everyone has heard that line, right? Everyone? Everyone's heard that line. <clears throat> Many of you have heard, whether it is nobler in the mind to suffer the stings and arrows of outrageous fortune, or take arms against a sea of troubles, and by opposing, end them, to die to sleep no more. It's his words that make him such an effective author, that pull out of us emotion because he describes the human condition in ways that we never would have imagined anyone could. Now we go to the end of Hamlet. Okay, so very complicated. The last scene, the king realizes that Hamlet is dangerous, and so the king arranges a duel between Hamlet and Laertes, who's a, a contemporary of his, and the, the king has poisoned Laertes rape here, so Hamlet's found to be killed. And if he isn't killed, the king has brought a poisoned wine to the table that he sets down that he's going to give to Hamlet if Laertes doesn't kill him. So here's a scene where Hamlet is dueling with Laertes. Laertes strikes him, and then <clears throat> from what's said, Hamlet begins to understand that it was a setup his mother drinks the wine <clears throat> and begins to die and Hamlet, Laertes strikes him but he drops the foil, Hamlet grabs it, stabs Laertes, then he stabs the king, his mother is dead, okay? By the way, <clears throat> everybody is dead. His father is dead, his, bro his uncle is dead, his mother is dead, uh, Ophelia, the daughter of Polonius, we haven't heard about, she committed suicide. He killed Laertes and he killed Polonius. So in this tragedy, there's no one left except 
Hamlet's friend Horatio. But he outdoes himself again with his words. Horatio comes, he embraces Hamlet, he tries to comfort him, and listen to the way Hamlet <coughs> ends the play. I am dead Horatio, wretched queen adieu. What a nice way to say goodbye to your mother, right? <laughs> Had I but time, now listen to these words, as this fell sergeant death is strict in his arrest. So what's the image? We get the image of death with a great helmet coming to arrest Hamlet because he's dead. And then he says, thank you, Horatio, hold me in your heart. But his final words are, absent thee from Felicity a while. Could anyone have said it more elegantly? No wonder we think he's a wonderful author. Now, in addition to the 1700, really 422 words, in addition to all the titles of books and everything, <coughs> there are phrases like this <coughs> from every play. These are just from Hamlet, to be or not to be. You've all heard, to the man born, I am a native here. You've all heard, more honored in the breach than the observance. Something is rotten in the state of Denmark. I was sitting in Water Street having dinner. Somebody here, a wag, came up and, and whispered in my ear, trying to make me nervous about today, no doubt. Something is rotten in the state of Denmark. You know, we're, uh, there he is, there he is. Get thee to a nunnery. This is what Hamlet said to Ophelia. And this last one is a beauty. Rich gifts wax poor when givers prove unkind. Okay. Here's King Lear. We were lucky to be in London and see Ian McClellan play this part. Now, King Lear's a little different, and we're not going to spend too much time on it. King Lear is noted as the most pathetic, the most tragic, the most desolate character in all of Shakespeare. But he illustrates perfectly the Greek tragic and Shakespearean tragic model where the tragic hero has a flaw <coughs> which brings him down. So Lear's horrible end is created solely by himself, no one else. And what we have here is lines on just one page from the first act and the last act. Okay. What Lear does, he says, I'm tired of being king. I'm going to divide my kingdom into three. And I have three daughters, Goneril, Reagan, and Cordelia. Whoever tells me they love me the most gets the biggest part of the kingdom. Now, what a stupid thing to do. <laughs> and what horrible consequences it brings. Because Lear, I gather, doesn't realize that his two older daughters are two of the vilest characters in all of literature. No one is as bad as they are. So, Lear says, which of you loves me the most? That we, our largest bounty, may extend to you where nature doth with merit challenge. Goneril. Sir, I love you more than words can wield a matter dearer than eyesight, space, and liberty, as much as child ever loved, etc. Reagan, the sister, <clears throat> my sister, I find she names my very deed of love, only she comes too short. I love you even more. Then, this is where the tragedy begins. Lear speaks to Cordelia. Cordelia is like King Henry V. She's one of the few, one of the, I'm, I'm getting gestured here to get over here. She's one of the few pure characters, Cordelia. Cordelia's not going to lie, she's not going to beg. And she's overwhelmed by what her sisters have done. So she just says, I love your majesty according to my bond, no more now le than no less. And Lear says, look at his language. How now, Cordelia? Mend your speech a little lest it may mar your fortunes. Mend your speech a little, lest it may mar your fortunes. 
Okay. Lear thinks he's going to have a hundred knights following him around. Goneril and Reagan take the knights from him. They ridicule him. He's cast out on the heath. He's wandering in the storm by himself. The Duke of Kent is loyal to him and he has a fool. And he wanders around and at the end of the play, all mayhem has taken place. Reagan has been poisoned by Goneril. Um, Goneril finally kills herself after asking her men to hang Cordelia, pretending that Cordelia killed herself. Her husband is dead. Everybody's killed each other, okay? And Lear comes upon the remnants of this. He goes into the room where Cordelia was, and he comes out. How many of you have seen King Lear? He comes out holding his child, his youngest daughter. And he says to the men standing around, Howl, 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 howl. Oh, you are men of stones. Had I your tongues and eyes, I'd use them so heaven's vault should crack. She's gone forever. And now this last line. Could anyone here have written it? Could, it, could Tolstoy have written it? Could Dostoevsky? Could anybody? Why should a dog, a horse, a rat have life and thou no breath at all? We have the definition of the most tragic character in Shakespeare who brought it all on himself. We have one more play only, Antony and Cleopatra. Look at them. <laughs> now, by the way, they look just the way Shakespeare would have intended them to look. They look resplendent, okay? So we only have one full page of lines from Antony and Cleopatra. However, Antony and, Clatra, uh, Antony and Cleopatra are like <coughs> Hamlet and Lear. By the end of the play, all the other characters, the major characters are dead, not from old age, having murdered, poisoned, and killed each other, okay? This was a bloody historical time in England. So, Antony is one of three Romans, it's called a triumvir, who take over the Roman Empire when Julius Caesar is assassinated in 44 BC. So, there's one named Lepidus who has the western end, Constantinople, all of that. In the middle is Octavius Caesar, he has the central part of Rome. And then Mark Antony is given <coughs> the Mediterranean, which includes Egypt. So Octavius Caesar in Rome gets in trouble because Ptolemy is attacking him. By the way, during these plays, everyone is attacking each other. Uh, they're, they're betraying each other. They're killing each It's horrible, OK? So he goes to Mark Antony, who is not at war with anyone, who's one of the three partners. He says, send me ships. And Mark Antony doesn't reply. And then Octavius Caesar hears that Mark Antony has gone crazy. And he's fallen into some snake pit of, vault, of, of luxurious living with a woman named Cleopatra. She's not a 19-year-old vamp. She's a mature woman. So they call Mark Antony back to Rome. Okay? And they're sitting there. Mark Antony has lost his I think second or third wife. So Octavius Caesar, who's in the middle of this, in control of it, says, marry my sister, good solid woman. That'll put you straight. And Antony leaves the room. Then the rest of the Romans say to Eno Barbarus, who is the general who's close to Mark Antony, his right-hand man, he said, look, he's left. For God's sake, would you tell us what it's like down there? What happened to him? What is Egypt? What's Cleopatra like? And then we get these magnificent descriptive lines. Here they come. Eno Barbaris is describing Cleopatra on her barge on the Nile, okay? The barge she sat in like a burnished throne burned on the water. 
The poop was beaten gold, purple the sails, and so perfumed that the winds were lovesick with them. The winds fell in love with her sails. The oars were silver, which to the tune of flutes kept stroke and made the water which they beat to flow faster, as amorous of their strokes. The water fell in love with the oars. And then they say, good heavens, I mean, this is really something. We get nothing like this in Rome. What is Cleopatra like? Ladies, how would you like it if somebody described you this way? Eno Barber said, for her own person, it beggared all description. It beggared all description. They don't give up. The Romans crowd around Eno Barbaris and they say, for God's sakes, at least take him away from Cleopatra. These four lines, this quatrain, are the greatest tribute to mature female sexuality in existence. Nobody's written anything like it. Listen to it, ladies. Age cannot wither her, nor custom stale her infinite variety. Other women cloy the appetites they feed, but she makes hungry where most she satisfies. The Romans give up. They don't know what's going to happen. Mark Antony goes back to Egypt. I won't, the complexity of, of the battles that happens. Octavius, Caesar sends a, a fleet and Mark Antony goes out to fight him from Egypt. Only he's, now listen, here's another Shakespearean trait. He's betrayed by Eno Barbers, his closest general, and by Cleopatra. He's desperate at the end, but what wonderful words we get out of this. He stabs himself, has himself carried to where Cleopatra is in her tower, and he says, <clears throat> I am dying, Egypt, dying. What word defines that sentence to make it unforgettable? One word, tell me. Egypt! It's not just a woman, it's an empire. I am dying, Egypt dying. Give me some wine and let me speak a while. And now we come to three lines within which are the title of a, to me, obnoxious but very popular television show. Do you think the authors of that show have even, even heard of Shakespeare? Not when you watch it, it's Wheel of Fortune. So what does Cleopatra say? No, let me speak and let me rail, let me cry so high that the false housewife fortune break her wheel provoked by my offense. There we are with the four plays. We've taken a narrow, simple view. We've just pulled the language out of them which seems to be so ultimately Shakespearean that no one else could ever write it and also so unforgettable that we carry it with us ever since high school. Now we have just two sonnets left. Sonnet uh, 29, an early sonnet, and sonnet uh, 116. Before we go to 29, there's a funny story. About 10 years ago, somebody running for Prime Minister of England <coughs> stole, uh, uh, what do they call it when you take some, plagiarized this sonnet in his appeals across the country. What he forgot was that every school child in England had learned this by heart. <laughs> and here it is. To me, this language is equal to or even greater than the stuff from his plays. When in disgrace with fortune in men's eyes, I all alone beweep my outcast state, and trouble deaf heaven, heaven is deaf to him, with my bootless cries, someone took his boots off. Who would have thought to put bootless and cries together? Who would have thought to make heaven deaf other than Shakespeare? 
I look, up, look upon myself and curse my fate, wishing me like to one more rich in hope, featured like him, like him with friends possessed, desiring this man's art and that man's scope with what I most enjoy, contented least. And then the last six lines. Like the lark at break of day, again, a stroke of genius, arising from sullen earth, sings hymns at heaven's gate. Okay, one more sonnet. Now, is there, has everyone in this room heard those first two lines and remember them? Let us not to the marriage of true minds admit impediments. Love is not love which alters when an alteration finds. It is an ever-fixed mark. Love's not time's fool. I mean, if anybody else wrote one of the 50 to 100 lines that we've been dealing with, they'd feel themselves delighted. He wrote every goddamn one of these lines and thousands more. And titles, the only, as, How, as Harold Bloom said, the only work which even threatens or comes close to him is the Holy Bible. So, we have considered what I think and just about everybody else is the greatest author in the world. We've tried to understand him by looking at the words he uses and the way he uses them so that he not only brings us to new understanding of men, <clears throat> historical events, but he enlarges the scope of our brain. He's a great author. And you've been a wonderful audience. And we're going to some questions now, and I thank you very much for coming. Now, one of the rules are no questions, uh, or, or no one's called on unless they raise their hand. Yes, sir. Uh, you mentioned 422 words. Right. Can you give us some? I've got them right here. <laughs> How would you like to write a book with this guy for two and a half years, which I've been doing? He wanted me to list the 422 words. Here they are, my dear fellow. You're going to come up and claim them. Just your favorites. First 10. No, 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 no. I'm not going into the 422 words, but it's a nice question. <laughs> Derek. You mentioned a lot about the meaning of the words. Uh, a little less about the tactics, specifically meter and rhyme. Ah. What elements of meter and rhyme do you think really the shape is used uh, with the method that is made better than others? By God, there's nothing like having a child brighter than you are. <laughs> um, Derek, I honestly don't know much about the, the meter and rhyme. Do you, do you have, uh, seriously, do you have any comment on that? Because that's something I ignored to my distress. So, uh, <coughs> Ron, of course, Shakespeare uses quite a bit. When a fool is speaking, you, they'll often speak with Ron. When there's something happening, with, uh, when they know that something's about to happen, look for the Ron, because Shakespeare's giving you the key that there's something magical going on. But typically, he uses iambic pentameter, which is a certain rhythm of the, uh, the words, so that there's syllables will sound familiar in this. Ever try to write an pentameter? You have to write the same meter for all of your lines. And when you switch from that, you notice. You notice you, if the pause is, is specific to his application. Whether it's, I'm, I'm obsessed, I'm lost, I'm angry. There's a reason you're no longer in that regular meter. By God, what a good. By the way, this is not a planted question. <laughs> I mean, one of the problems of becoming older as a father is that it appears that your children are getting smarter while you're getting dumber. <laughs> That's a damn good answer. There was someone who was going to ask some, uh, something about Queen Elizabeth with that person, Dave? There are, there are a number of theories about 
about who Shakespeare was. Uh, and they fall into two camps, one camp being the scholars of Shakespeare who insist that in fact he is hard and then there is a whole other camp that has a series of theories about who he might be. And they start out based on the observation that Shakespeare knows an extraordinary amount about how royalty and the aristocracy works. He knows an extraordinary amount about how the English law functions. Absolutely. And he knows an extraordinary amount about history. None of those fit very well together with the notion that he is from a lower middle class family in Stratford. <coughs> his parents were illiterate and his daughters were illiterate. It just doesn't fit very well with the language. So these folks have a whole series of theories. The most attention comes around the fact that he was, in fact, the 17th Earl of Oxford and the 16th Earl, together with Queen Elizabeth I, father of him. Wow! <laughs> and the theories go on. There's a, there's a book written called Oxford's Son of Queen Elizabeth I by a mother named Paul Strikes. And Cheryl and I took an adult ed course from him um, when we were back on the other end of the state. And it was, it was captivating. Not many people give him great credibility, but he tells a wonderful story. <laughs> he goes on to say that not only was he the Earl of Oxford, but in 1604, when he was supposed to have died, in fact, he was spirited away at one point or another, and spent the last five years of his life writing, among others, he included the Tempest in that period. He did quite a few of the sonnets, and the most fun, which ties in with her comparison of the literature of Shakespeare to the Bible, the theory is that he was a very active participant in putting together the King James Version of the Bible. Wow. <laughs> Terrific. Wow. That's a talk in itself. <laughs> Bravo, Dave, and bravo, Derek Martin. Now, someone else has an ancestor who's known, <laughs> Kevin? So, so, Aaron, I'm pleased that this book tonight was appropriate for this audience. Uh, but my forefathers were not happy with Shakespeare. Uh, and my, I don't know how many greats they have, a great, 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 great grandfather, Thomas Fowler, who lived in Shrewsbury, thought that um, for his more gaudy plays, and they should be rewritten so that women and children could see them and not be offended. Uh, and hence the word to bow to rights. Which is your last name, your family name. Wow. Look what we've got. <laughs> Somebody else. Oh, come on. We, we, we have, we've had three or four magnificent, incisive, deep questions. Derek again. If you were new to Shakespeare, maybe either young or just new to Shakespeare, what might be your recommendation for the first thing to read? Ooh, that's a good question. The first thing to read, I start with the sonnets. I think the sonnets are, are uh, because the plays are long and complex. If you could hear all the characters in Lear, his daughter, uh, his daughters marry, uh, Cordelia marries the King of France. Uh, one marries the Duke of Cornwall, another one Albany. Uh, Gloucester comes in with illegitimate. It's an amazing complex thing. So I would start <laughs> with the sonnets. Yes. Um, I taught junior high school. We read Romeo and Juliet, and kids that age really related to that play. Now, does anybody, could you cite for us that wonderful quatrain of uh, <laughs> Romeo under Juliet's balcony? He's been there all night. He's wait, waiting for her to wake up and look out at him. Do you remember that? <laughs> it's magnificent. It's 
Hark. Go ahead. O'Reilly? No. Hark. What light through yonder window breaks? Again, Shakespeare. The light is breaking the window. He uses the, the word break in two or three ways. Hark what light through yonder window breaks, says young Antony down in the bushes. <coughs> it is the east, and Juliet is the sun. Arise, fair sun, and kill the envious moon. Imagine the sun is coming up, it's going to kill, and the moon is envious because he's losing. Oh my God. <laughs> so the kids love that. Riley, did, did you ever do Romeo and Juliet? And what did you play? I played Balthazar, who was Romeo's messenger. Wow. And, and that was a professional gig. Here's the young lady who's... Are you in Actors' Equity yet? Not yet. Hopefully soon. Hopefully soon. Okay. Anyone else have... Come on. Yes. Have you heard of the Shakespearean baseball game? No. They a comedy team, Wayne and Schuster, and they put on a parody... They play a baseball game, it's about 10 minutes, on YouTube. And uh, they take quotes from all these plays, and you will really laugh. <laughs> well, you know, the one thing that you introduce is, um, why give a talk? Well, one reason that you give a talk is you're so excited you want to share something about someone. But another reason is to give people the idea to go back to Shakespeare to see a play, and someone here this evening, I think it was Belinda, or, or someone said, was it, someone said, the plays shouldn't be read or discussed like this, they should be seen with the actors. So, go see a Shakespeare play, read Shakespeare, he will enrich your life, are there any other questions? Yes. Oh, Monica, daughter. <laughs> uh, so why was it that there was so much bodiness and double entendre in his written words as well as uh, humor? Well, uh, when he was a teenager, I believe, he went to London and, and began being an actor. That was the first thing he did. And then he became one of the king's men, a, a more important actor. And then he began writing plays. He began writing plays in about 1589 or 1590, uh, when he was about 24 or five years old. And I think that was the spirit of the times. I think those plays were very bawdy. I think the audience expected <coughs> sexual and humorous nuances. It was almost vulgar. And I think he was just reflecting, yes. <coughs> um, from what I understand, the, the low pits were as where the commoners would sit. And so if you didn't amuse them and didn't have that language, they would throw tomatoes and rotten tablets. Oh, that's wonderful. So it was a game to keep them satisfied as well as the others. Wow. Which is why there was the double play. Well taken again. Tertius, this, I'm making an exception. In the beginning, before people were here, I said, I hope I can express a complex subject simply. What do you think? <laughs> oh my God, that's not a planted answer. You know, instead of saying, yes, you did, Harry, you know what he said? I said, I hope I've expressed a complex issue simply. And Tertius said, I hope you did too, Harry. <laughs> I, I think we'll, I'm a great admirer because he's given many talks here. God bless you, Tertius. God bless you for coming. Thanks. So, thank you all. Thank you all for coming. Our next Sunday program will be June 9th. Put it on your calendars. When we have, it, it will be in the library and we will have uh, the uh, a speaker from the Florence Griswold Museum. So, um, and I think her topic is art and the uh, New England farm. So we hope to see you all here. Thank you. Yay.